So we were looking at particle motion in the Schwarzschild metric, or at least part of the Schwarzschild metric which describes black holes, so that we were in this region and this region with the possibility of something going in, and uh, we had were looking at things that looked like that. So I think what we had done was to get as far as having an action for this. The action was going to be this trajectory we could call xA of some parameter. Um, S. S, absolutely right. And the action was integral dS into minus V of R v dot squared plus 2v dot r dot plus r squared theta dot squared plus r squared sine squared theta phi dot squared where v was 1 minus 2m over r um, so what we need to do is to compute the Euler-Lagrange equations. Uh, the first thing to do to make life easy for yourself is to choose to make the particle lie, have its motion entirely in the equatorial plane. And you can do that as a consequence of spherical symmetry, but it may not be entirely obvious that that's a consistent thing to do, or even that it's really possible to do it. So perhaps I ought to explain how that works. So you want to look at the theta equation of motion. First of all. So if you do that, there's a theta dot here and a theta here, and you will end up with discovering that r squared theta dot, all dotted, is equal to r squared sine theta cos theta um, phi dot squared. So that's the theta equation of motion. And it is kind of obvious that if you choose theta to be equal to pi by 2, then of course r squared theta dot, all dotted, is 0. So that tells you that theta double dot is going to be r squared theta dot dot is equal to zero at whatever instant you've chosen it. So if you choose to be in the equatorial plane at some instant, then of course if your particle is here, then of course you can always choose this plane to be in the same, you can always choose coordinates such that uh, the particle is in this plane. What is less obvious, you can choose the velocity to be, to be in that plane. So were it to be the case that the velocity were going out of your first choice, some direction like that, then of course you can rotate the plane so that the velocity is always in the plane. So it's not quite the case that theta equals pi by 2 is all you have to do. You have to choose your plane carefully so that the particle will stay in this plane. So it's more than just thinking that theta has got to be equal to pi by 2. You have to choose your plane in such a way that the particle will continue to move in the plane. That's the sort of less obvious part of the whole thing. So this will be true initially. So let's assume that we have done that. Then you can simply forget this term and put theta equal to pi by 2, which puts this thing equal to 1. <coughs> then you can do what you usually do, which is to compute the equations of motion. So, first of all, 
phi is an ignorable coordinate because there's a phi dot in this action, but no phi. So you immediately conclude that r squared phi dot is a constant. It is conventional to call that constant uh, L. That's because if you think about it, r squared phi dot is basically the angular momentum per unit mass of something. The second ignorable coordinate is v. There is no v in this expression, only factors of v dot. And so you will discover that minus v times v dot plus r dot is also equal to a constant. Typically that constant is called e. Um, and is essentially the energy per unit mass. Um, I'm wondering about signs of something. Um, my constant of integration appears to be minus the energy. You can see that because it's basically minus t dot at infinity. I think this is an unfortunate fact. Lastly, you might contemplate the radial equation of motion. So you could work out what the radial equation of motion is coming from this action, but there really isn't any point. The reason that there is no point is that you already know that for any geodesic, g a b x dot a x dot b has got to be equal to a constant as a consequence of the first integral of the geodesic equation. So you don't really need to work out what the radial equation of motion is. All you need to do is to take the two constants you've already found and the fact that you've put things in the equatorial plane, and that is enough to tell you about the radial motion. So the radial motion can be deduced from this. And I think that I called my constant epsilon, being either 0 or minus 1, depending whether you're time-like or space-like. Sorry, time-like or null. Um, you could, of course, work out the radial equation of motion if you wanted to and integrate it, but you'll just end up back here. So what do you actually get from doing that? Well, you'll end up with minus v times v dot squared plus 2v dot r dot plus r squared phi dot squared is equal to epsilon. You use the fact that you already know what v dot is from here and phi dot is from up here to calculate the radial equation of motion. So you end up with minus v, a function of r, into v dot squared. That's e plus e minus r dot divided by minus v all squared plus 2r dot into e minus r dot divided by minus v plus r squared. Phi dot is l over r squared. l squared over r to the fourth is what you get and that's equal to epsilon. You now need to collect up some terms and so you will end up with 
e squared over v of r with a minus sign coming from that squared. Then there will be a 2 e r dot over v squared times v and a minus sign which cancels with this similar looking term. Then there will be a term involving r dot squared. We have um, 2 r dot r dot over v from there. And we have a minus r dot squared over v from here. So you'll end up with a plus r dot squared over v of r from that term. And then you'll be left with this thing here, which is plus l squared over r squared equals epsilon. And that's what you get. If you were energetic, you could integrate this up, but you would have to use elliptic functions to find the general solution. So there is a known general solution in terms of elliptic functions. So we could do this, but we're not going to. Uh, if you really wanted to, you can, of course, do it. There is a simple trick for trying to understand the motion of the particle. And so it's actually rather more interesting to learn the trick and develop some intuition rather than look at some horrible integrals of something that looks like that. So the trick is sort of, the first part of it is borrowed from what you do if you did Newtonian physics. If you're dealing with Kepler's problem, and this is basically just a relativistic version of Kepler's problem, your first reaction at this stage would be to say, ah, invent a new variable, r, which looks like 1 over u, the inverse radius. That doesn't quite work here nicely. You are better off by inventing a new variable which is 2m over u. So this is going to be the first step on the way to finding that. Now, the next thing that you might remember from Newtonian physics is that equations involving time aren't nice, but equations for the shape of the orbit are nice. So we want to sort of head in the direction of looking for equations which describe the shape of an orbit. Well, that's, you can get yourself a clue to how to do this. If you contemplate r dot, that of course is equal to minus 2m over u squared times u dot. Now, it's true you've got lots of r dots here, but what you really want to do is to rewrite this in terms of u as a function of phi rather than as a function of s. As things stand, u equals u of s and phi equals phi of s determine everything, but you're much better off looking at u as a function of phi by changing the variables. So let's try to do that. Well, that's true in Newtonian physics too. Minus 2m over u squared. So here I'd have du d phi, in which case I better have phi dot here. But phi dot I already know to be L over R squared. But I already know that R times U from here is 2M. So you are better off rewriting this as minus L over 2M du d phi. So the whole thing collapses down to something which looks like that. So that's rather nice. So what you do is you now substitute this expression for r dot and this expression for r into this formula.
let's see. You have got an r dot squared minus e squared. This is a common factor divided by v of r. So r dot squared is l squared over 4m squared du d phi all squared. So that's r dot squared. You subtract off e squared. So that's the r dot squared minus e squared from here. You then divide by v of r, but that's just 1 over 1 minus u. Then you have an l squared over r squared here. That is equal to, well, l squared is l squared. r squared is 4m squared over u squared. So it's l squared over 4m squared times u squared. And that's equal to epsilon. So what you will notice here is that this factor here and that factor there are the same. Um, probably the easiest thing to do is now to multiply by one minus u to get rid of that. 4m squared over l squared to get rid of that. But it's nice to put in a factor of 2 for reasons that will become clear in a second. The result is going to be a half du d phi all squared. Then there will be from here a term which just looks like a half u squared minus a half u cubed. So that just comes from this term here. Then there will be some terms which don't depend on u. And those are 2m squared over l squared into e plus epsilon squared plus epsilon. So that's the sort of final point of this bit of the calculation. Now again, if you wanted to work out what this was... Um, Sorry, don't, don't you get it epsilon times 1 minus u? Yes, thank you. It's written perfectly clearly here. OK, so you get that. So this is the equation of motion. Again, if you wanted to integrate it up exactly, you'd have to use elliptic functions to do it. But there is a sneaky trick that you can use. If you want to understand what... Uh, the motion of the particle is going to be, the simplest thing to do is to think of some other system that has something which looks like this. So, the analog model is to just consider particle motion in one dimension, in a potential. So I'll call u of x. We all know what the answer to that is going to be. It's governed by the energy equation. A half, let's make it um, unit mass. Half x dot squared plus u of x equals the total energy. Well, this is, of course, the same. This thing is the analog of the kinetic energy. These three terms here are the analog of the potential energy. And the constant on the right-hand side is the analog of the total energy. <coughs> 
So you can get an intuitive understanding of what's going on here just by drawing a picture. And the picture, only picture that you need to draw is a picture of the potential energy. That's not so hard. It might be that you don't like doing that, which is unfortunate. But if you wanted to, you could look at this thing and sort of go back a step. You could differentiate this with respect to phi. So this we'll call the equation of motion. Well, it's the energy equation. Let's call it the energy equation. You could differentiate the energy equation with respect to phi. So I'm going to do that and divide throughout by du d phi. That's not too hard. The first thing here that you would get is a half times 2 du d phi times d2 u d phi squared. So you'll just end up with a d2 u d phi squared. The second term you'll get is u times du d phi. The third term that you will get is minus 3 halves u squared times du d phi. And lastly, you'll get this term here, which I'll put on the other side, equals minus 2m squared epsilon over L squared. Thus revealing the fact that this thing is a constant of integration, which is what you'd expect from the total energy. The value of writing it this way is that you can compare this easily with the Newtonian result. The Newtonian result is the same, apart from this term. So that term there, you can regard as the general relativistic correction to what would otherwise be entirely Newtonian. Having invented all this machinery, it's kind of useful to do a simple calculation with it. So let's do the first calculation that's easy to do. Um, let's look at the motion of light. So to do that, you put epsilon equals zero. And then you look at the potential energy function. So here is u, and the potential energy function is just a half u squared minus a half u cubed. Remember that u equals zero is r is equal to infinity. So this is r equals infinity, if you like. 
And a picture of this potential is something which looks like that. For u small, it looks like a half u squared. As u gets large, eventually this term will dominate and the potential is unbounded below. So now you can easily describe motion of light near a black hole. The first thing you will notice is that it's possible to just simply sit at the top of this potential. If you chose your energy right, you could just sit there. So a lucky choice of energy will leave you sitting at the top of the potential. <coughs> Where is the top of the potential? The potential is a half u squared minus a half u cubed. So the maximum will be u minus 3 halves of u squared equals 0. So that's u equals 0, which is dull, and u equals 2 thirds. But if you think about u equals 2 thirds, that's the same thing as r is equal to 2m over u, which is 2m over 2 thirds is equal to 3m. So, what you discovered is that light can orbit a black hole at radius 3m. You can call this a circular null geodesic. At r is equal to 3m. You will, of course, notice it's unstable. If you perturb this geodesic, say, for example, by a passing grain of dust or something, perturbed it, you would fall off either in this direction or in that direction. If you move to the left in this picture, the photon would escape to infinity. If you move to the right, u would increase without bound. And if u increases without bound, r decreases without bound. And so it would fall into the black hole. So it either escapes if you perturb it slightly or falls in depending on whether you do it in a way that u increases or decreases. This brings us to an unfortunate fact about Penrose diagrams that is worth pointing out. What does this geodesic, null geodesic, look like in the Penrose diagram? So we're thinking of some situation that looks like that. This circular null geodesic sits at r equals 3m. Oops. So it looks like that. You would almost certainly swear blind that that was a time-like line. Not so. Of course, the reason that this has happened is because we've really projected four dimensions down to two here. So this, when you project it down, looks time-like, but of course it isn't. Remember that when we drew the Penrose diagram, uh, we got rid of two dimensions and really only considered motion in the what was effectively the TR plane. That's not what's happening here. So this is a circular, didn't have to be, but it is, circular null geodesic. Even though it looks like it ought to be time-like. 
This does not happen in Minkowski space. Were you to do this calculation in Minkowski space, um, I can't remember, I don't know whether Dr. Stewart told you this. I did, but you may not have noticed. Um, I really don't want to erase that. Let's erase this. In Minkowski space, the Penrose diagram looks like this. And it turns out that all null geodesics end at scry. Plus or minus, depending whether you're interested in the past or future endpoint. So, a null geodesic has got to look something like that. Um, they're supposed to meet up. Or, whatever you do, it's got to look like that. So, for example, if it misses r equals zero, then it could look like that. It's another null geodesic. That would have some kind of angular momentum. But it can never look like this. <coughs> Um, the fact that this happens is a peculiar consequence of the fact that gravity affects light as well as matter. Well, after that slight digression, let's go back to motion of light. Well, now it's kind of obvious what is going to happen. Suppose, for example, I was interested in projecting light in from infinity. Then, if its total energy, that is to say this expression here, is small, if I start off, then light will come in in this direction. It will bounce off the potential and then go out. On the other hand, if it has enough total energy in this picture, of course, it will go straight over this maximum, and u will increase, and r will decrease, and it will end up inside the black hole. So there's a kind of obvious picture here that if this quantity is sufficiently large, then it will end up, light will always end up in the black hole. So we can use this um, to calculate the scattering cross section. And, of course, you can do this without doing complicated calculations. So let's calculate the um, absorption cross-section. So here is the black hole sitting here. That corresponds to R equals 2m. If you shine light at it, it might be, well, of course, if you did it on axis along this line, then it would go straight in and you'd have absolutely no problem. Suppose that you did it a little bit off axis, then, of course, it looks like it ought to go straight in. But if you did it far enough off axis, all that will happen is it will get bent. The difference between these things really is the angular momentum about this point of the photon in question. So the usual way to do this is to invent an impact parameter, usually called b, the distance the photon has off axis, as you would do really in any scattering experiment. Now, what will happen? If we look at this thing, the thing that we're calling the energy, um, that one. this thing that's calling the energy, 2m squared at e squared over l squared, obviously this thing, if l is small, what we're calling the total energy goes up. If l is large, the energy is decreasing. So that indeed corresponds to this picture. All we need now is to calculate 
the value of L. L is equal to R squared phi dot. The easiest way to understand that is to say it's R times R phi dot. And that's just uh, V times uh, Uh, B. So that's the velocity of something times the impact parameter. This is equal to 1 in our units because it's moving at the speed of light. So this is in fact equal to B. to do is to calculate what the dividing value of E is between the two possibilities. Well, E, total energy, in inverted commas, that's equal to 2m squared E squared for L squared. If that is greater than this maximum, then you'll get absorption. So if this is greater than the maximum, and let's see, the maximum is equal to, let's call it u max. u max, just from the fact it's a half u squared minus a half u cubed, that's going to be half u squared minus a half u cubed, uh, let's see, that is equal to, I'm sure I wrote it down somewhere, 2 27ths. So if this is greater than 2 27ths, then you'll get absorption. So, in other words, if m e over l is greater than 2 27ths, then you get absorption. Now, let's go back to our constants. Is that yes. <laughs> 1 27th. Looks better. <coughs> so let's look at the energy. The energy we said was equal to R dot minus V times V dot out near infinity. So as R goes to infinity. This is equal to r dot minus t dot minus r dot, which is roughly speaking uh, the same thing as minus t dot. And for a photon, that's just equal to minus dt d epsilon, uh, minus dt ds. Uh, let's think a bit harder about L. L, we said, was r squared phi dot. That is equal to r phi dot times r. And as r goes to infinity, uh, this thing is going to just simply tend to e times b. If you like, you can write that as r squared times d phi dt dt ds, which it makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. So this is just equal to e times b. I think I might have left out a factor of e from this because this is dt d, d phi ds, not d phi dt. So I'll put my factor of e back in. Well, I'll just get rid of that. <laughs> 
So that tells me that E over L is equal to uh, just 1 over B. So if m times m divided by the impact parameter is greater than 1 over root 27, the photon is absorbed. Now let's think about the definition of um, scattering cross-section. Scattering cross-section is defined to be find the maximum value of B for which the particle falls in. So let's suppose it's something which looks like this. So this is B max. So the maximum value of B for which the particle falls in Well, that's going to be equal to 3 root 3 n. The cross section for absorption is just equal to pi times B max squared. So that tells us the absorption cross section for light. for a black hole is equal to pi times b max squared, that's 27 pi m squared. <coughs> Dimensionally, that's obviously right. You might have expected pi times the Schwarzschild radius squared. Dimensionally, that's true, but it's actually enhanced by a bit. Now, there are probably all kinds of other things that you can do with this equation that I don't really have time to do. Um, we could ask the same questions about massive particles, um, which is a little bit easier, a little bit harder, I'm sorry. Um, so we could do the same thing for massive particles. In this case, epsilon is equal to minus 1. And it's a bit harder. If we think about that, the total energy, sorry, the potential energy is now given by a half u squared minus a half u cubed minus 2m squared u over l squared. So now the energy function has become a bit more complicated. And roughly speaking, if you try and draw a picture of this, you will discover that there are really three basic possibilities. This function, if you think about it, still becomes unbounded below as u becomes large and positive. And it's necessarily the case that it's equal to zero at um, infinity. But there are two sort of things that could happen. It could be that at the origin, the slope is positive, sorry, the slope is negative. And you know that there are going to be two turning points. And the question is whether or not those turning points are real. So that's one thing that you need to look at. 
The other thing that you might be worried about is whether or not those happen at positive or negative values of uh, the energy, because this thing has got um, this thing ought to be positive. So there's a question of whether or not these turning points at positive values of the potential. So we have to worry about those two possibilities, well, two things. And of course, you know that course, the slope at the origin has got to be negative, because for sufficiently small u, this thing is going to dominate, which makes it all a little bit different to what happened before. So case one is where the turning point turns out to be at positive values of the potential. So it looks something like that. This will happen uh, provided 16m squared over L squared is less than 1. So we'll call this case 1. That's kind of obvious because what you're saying is that this term is relatively small so that the situation will look rather like the situation for this thing not being here, provided you get sufficiently far away from the origin. So if you got rid of that linear term, then of course this would start off there, it'd go up and then go down. That's the situation that you have here. Then there are some the possibility that this maximum occurs for a value of the potential that is negative. I guess I'll call that u and this. So here you have a situation that looks something like this. It goes down. There is a maximum, but it happens below the axis. And this happens in the region 4 thirds is greater than 16 m squared over L squared is greater than 1. Lastly, it's possible to have no turning points. In this case, call this case 2. in which case it just simply goes down forever, something like that. And that will happen if 12m squared over L squared is greater than 1. So there are really three different qualitatively different things that can happen depending on the values of m over L. So what I will do on Wednesday is to calculate the absorption cross-section for uh, slowly moving let's say, non-relativistic particles in the neighbourhood of a black hole. Okay.